who have been incredibly inspired by everybody's presentation. So I just want to say thank you very much for having us. Um, so and one of the things that I was thinking about and just listening to all the presentations earlier was um, how great it is that everyone has these long-term relationships and partnerships um, with the people that they're working with, whether it's in the country or outside the country, to influence change. And I think we all know that change takes time to happen. So um, I, I really appreciate the investment of time that you all have given, because that's the value that we have at the Global Foundation as well. So, so, um, the World Health Organization estimates that there are about 32 million children worldwide who have disabling hearing loss. And it's about 6 per 1,000 births that is infected with um, a different impairment, making it one of the most common birth defects in newborns. Those of you who, well, I think most of you here, were born with normal hearing. So, or you have children with normal hearing. And when you were born into the world, you go through a natural process of developing your listening skills and your language skills. So over time, you listen, and then you start to make some noise, you babble, and then you speak a couple words, and then those words turn into speech and language. There's a natural progression that children go through in the first year of life. So a child that's born deaf does not go through that same progression because they cannot hear. So um, we, what we do know, though, is that if we identify a child with a hearing loss as early as possible, ideally right after birth, this child can be fit with hearing amplification and with support of trained professionals be able to learn to listen and speak. And if we do that early enough, there's enough time to catch up to a normal hearing peer and be able to go on to develop spoken language, attend mainstream schools, and um, have more about cover, uh, greater opportunities in life. So what this slide here is showing, these are the four key elements that make it possible for listening and spoken language development in children with hearing loss. The early identification, which I mentioned. So hearing screening are important. The hearing technology in the way of hearing aids or cochlear implants. Then there needs to be locally based trained professionals in the country where the uh, child is to be able to help that child make sense of sound that they were not born hearing so that they can learn to listen and talk. And finally, family involvement. So these four areas are equally important, but unfortunately in many low resource countries, one, two, three, or all of these areas are missing. So the Global Foundation for Children with Hearing Loss works with local partners across both education and healthcare in developing countries to identify and address gaps in the support <coughs> for children with, who are under six years of age with hearing loss in their families. So we, but we focus on both education and healthcare because you cannot just address one bucket of the problem and think that you're going to solve the whole problem. We cannot only focus on hearing screening and think that the problem is solved. You have, to, you have to really address the whole, you have to take a holistic approach to the problem. So that's what we do at the Global Foundation. And we currently have programs in Vietnam and Mongolia. So um, today, um, I would like to just talk briefly about um, our focus on capacity building in the countries where we work. And it's more than just teacher training, it's also thinking about the resources, the equipment, the um, awareness, uh, the different elements that need to be in place for children with hearing loss to be successful with their development. And this complicated chart here um, is kind of a graphical picture of how our model works. So in the middle, there's a child who's born with a hearing loss, and if this family would like for the child to be able to listen and speak, there's some people that need to be in place to be able to support that child. So we're talking about teachers, therapists, medical professionals, the family. And those people need to have knowledge about different topics. So audiology, early intervention, 
medical support, auditory verbal practice, all these different things that they need to know about. When you overlay the Global Foundation program, so our professional development and training, uh, public outreach and awareness, and resources and hearing technology, we are touching all of these people across these different areas of expertise. And because we promote the train the trainer approach to our work, the people that we train are training others so that more in the community benefit, and as a result, more children with hearing loss are able to learn to listen and speak. So in Mongolia, to give you an example of how uh, we've been able to apply kind of this holistic approach, um, the Ministry of Health in Mongolia um, initiated, or they passed a mandate, I guess, passed a mandate in 2014 to make hearing screening a national initiative. So they wanted every baby born in Mongolia to have a hearing test. So we uh, started talking with them about that. And, and uh, there, were, there were no um, resources or expertise to be able to implement that mandate. And so uh, we started collaborating with the medical community there. But going back to that umbrella, we cannot just focus on the hearing screening. There's all the other elements that we also have to think about too. Fortunately, in Mongolia, the government does provide subsidies for cochlear implants. Hearing aids um, are not covered by the government, but families, for the most part, have been able to, um, to get to be able to afford those. But what they were weak in were these three areas, the newborn hearing screening, the knowledge in the audiology, and auditory verbal factors to perform the speech therapy, especially in the hearing loss and raising awareness. And so um, that was our path in Mongolia. So in September of 2016, we between September 2016 to just this past April, we provided hearing screening devices to all the maternal hospitals in the capital. So those of you who know about Mongolia, it's a very nomadic country. You think of Genghis Khan and Camel and mm -hmm. running into the desert. But um, most of the people, half of the population actually lives in the capital. And there's 80,000 babies born in the country, and about 40,000, almost half or, or half, are born in the capital. So pretty quickly, we can make a pretty big impact. Um, so by providing hearing screening devices to the hospitals in the capital, now every baby born there can get a hearing test for the first time ever. And we're in the process now of networking those hospitals so that they can share information for better tracking and um, making sure that the appropriate follow-up for babies who don't pass their screening is in place. In addition, oh, and then this is the, um, the training that we provided about the hearing screening, where um, we, we provided training on how to use the devices but now they're at a point where the Mongolians that we train are training other doctors and nurses in the capital. So we're actually no longer involved with the training, which is a great, um, it was a great progress that we don't have to be directly involved in the training. And um, so now all the hospitals in the capital are implementing the screening. <coughs> so far this year, 15,000 babies have been screened. And that number is going to increase uh, because now every hospital has the ability to do that. And then in addition to the screening program, we also provide the training in, um, in this case, audiology, which is the practice um, after a child is identified, there's a medical part that needs to diagnose the child and provide appropriate amplification, pro-hearing aid, cochlear implant um, for that child. And so there are ENT doctors in um, Mongolia that are engaged in our training program. And our program is um, it's a kind of a curriculum base. So over a period of time, they learn the knowledge. So it's not just one workshop, it's a series of workshops that we provide. And all of our presentations and materials are translated and bound into a handbook, about 500 pages of material that they can keep for themselves to use as a reference. And in a country like Mongolia, where audiology and speech therapy are very new, um, these types of resources are very helpful to them to have. 
And we also provide the auditory verbal practice or speech therapy training. And um, as you can see, there's lecture, and then we also do practicum to allow the therapist to be trained the opportunity to practice what they're learning. And there is, um, what, there's a couple of small classroom of uh, early intervention for children with hearing loss. So we're working with the classroom as well as the therapy-based model. And the people that we train are um, empowered to train others in the country. So that, um, and that's been interesting from a cultural perspective, because auditory verbal practice originated in the United States. But in Vietnam especially, and we are seeing it in Mongolia as well, um, taking the fundamentals of the practice, but then making it culturally relevant to the family in the country so that it becomes adopted by those families. It's something that's been really interesting to observe. Um, and then the media piece, um, the country, because it is nomadic, people in the countryside move around a lot, whereas the people in the city stay intact. But everybody seems to watch TV, and everybody um, has, has a cell phone. So we've been fortunate to be on any um, television station and had a chance to share our message of the importance of newborn hearing screening especially, <coughs> that if you, if you are a parent and you think that your child may have a hearing loss, to be sure to come in quickly to get it addressed and to explain why that was important. And as a response to this media attention, we had several families who came in with their children who are two or three years old. Um, so they weren't screened at birth, obviously, but they thought that there could be something wrong with their hearing. And because they saw the media, they acted on it, or they might not have otherwise. So just briefly, uh, I just have a couple of slides on Vietnam. Um, we followed a similar model in Vietnam, where we took the holistic approach to trying to increase capacity in Vietnam. And after nine years there, doing similar type work, um, there's now a strong foundation of expertise in audiology, in auditory verbal practice. There's early intervention centers, a lot of resources that are in place now in Vietnam for kids with hearing loss, in addition to the hearing technology. Um, just last year, the Ministry of Education um, approached us to help them develop a curriculum that the government can use to train future teachers and therapists working with children with hearing loss in Vietnam. And that was a huge progress because the first time I went to Vietnam, many of the teachers and therapists did not, they were not even aware that children with hearing loss could learn to listen and speak. Um, I actually was born with a hearing loss. I, I take these off, I'm deaf, I'm completely deaf, and um, I, I can sleep very well at night. <laughs> but, um, but I was fortunate to have all those early intervention services. So when I went to Vietnam that first time, they couldn't believe it. They looked in my ears and they took me around Vietnam and they would say, just say something. So they would be like, well, it was really pretty funny. But the lessons that I got from that was like, there's so many places that just don't even know if it's possible, it's similar to autism. So if we can transfer the knowledge and expertise, then more children in the world will have the opportunity to do whatever they want in life. So the greater government engagement with huge. And just uh, just this past month, the, uh, one of the cochlear implant companies called Sonova um, entered into a partnership with us to provide 15 years of support for um, 10 children in Vietnam to not only get the cochlear implant and surgery and early intervention support for their cost for 15 years, but also um, to utilize the Vietnamese professionals that we have trained in the country. And the only way that that partnership came to reality is because they recognized that we had had a hand in developing the infrastructure of support that needs to be in place for those cochlear implants to be successful. So at the end of the day, um, the comprehensive nature of what we try to do, um, I, I hope perhaps to resonate that you, again, cannot just focus on one piece of the puzzle, but trying to understand the whole system of care and how we can improve it on a system basis 
so that um, more children can benefit. about the cochlear implant page. Does it have to be changed as children grow up? Do, do they need a second surgery? Uh, oh. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, for the implant itself, it's inside the head, it's a surgical procedure. And um, that, it, it can last many like, like hopefully with a many lifetimes, but usually you might have to get another surgery but the external piece um, needs to be updated. Um, the warranty lasts for five years, so the company wants you to update every five years. Uh, I'm pretty, I wanted to comment on that question. So basically, I got implanted in 2003. So when I got implanted in 2003, the only implant that was available was a body worn position. So it was like a cable that goes to a machine down here with you clip your belt. Now, oh, as technology advances, like maybe like a couple of years back, they came up with a new technology called behind the ear only. Because when they came up with behind the ear models, you keep a cell phone with that. <laughs> but now, with the latest technology, they're able to cut down the cell phone noise and they come up with a Bluetooth uh, adapter that you hang around the chain. So you pair your cell phone with the Bluetooth and boom, you're <laughs> so, so, so what the basic two components is, you have a ship that is in charge inside of your head. So it goes with the cable that goes to the back of a cockpit. So when that is in charge, it is a permanent thing. You don't have to worry about it. What happens outside is what is changeable. Okay. There was one child in my school, I'm also on the same field. Mm. One child in my school had to have three surgeries. Because the doctor kept saying there is an advanced uh, technology. I mean, technology is advanced, so you have to change the cochlear, I mean, change the implant. Mm. So the child had three surgeries. But the problem is, uh, I don't know in our country how ethical the medical practitioners are, whether they are taking the children for a ride mm. or whether they are really doing what should be done. It's a big money-making institution there. Mm. Yeah, how many of these doctors anymore? get trained to do this cochlear implant? Did yeah. they bring physicians from overseas? Or? It's 11 lakhs in Chennai. In yeah. India, it's 11 lakhs of rupees. Pardon? 11 lakh rupees in India. Uh, divide by 68. <laughs> 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 they provide training. There's 
So they already have that expertise. They have that. That's why that was one of the things that was important with that partnership with the Kirkland Implant Capital Donation. Um, in Mongolia, they have one surgeon and they're training others. So okay. they have that expertise. Paige, didn't you send the doctors from here though over to the they do one for a while, but um, there are vacations and... So initially they did one? Yes. The first day itself is not that big of a uh, the question you said the uh, cochlear implant company has an agreement with the Vietnam government or which cochlear company is it, is it all the company or the company? There's all the companies. There's surgeons that work in the hospital and they've been trained by the Vietnam government. Okay. Um, Are all the children developing language and speech? Do you mainstream them? Uh, wait, did I get there? Do all the children develop language and speech? Do you mainstream them? Yeah, they, they, that's the goal. Thank you. Yeah, so our work is focused on children under six. So it's all the early intervention therapy with the goal that they move into mainstream school uh, by the time they're in first grade. So um, it gives them greater education. In a country like Vietnam, for example, and Mongolia as well, there are greater educational opportunities if you're able to be in the mainstream. Just out of curiosity, of the 15,000 screenings that have been done in Mongolia, what is the incidence? Mm -hmm. How many were discovered with a hearing loss? Uh, great question. That's why we're setting up the tracking system. Um, so they have given me some numbers, but I think I'm, they're not incredibly reliable. Um, what we're doing now is setting up software so all the hospitals, there's six hospitals engaged, they'll be centralized to one. Uh, data point and then be a tracking center and somebody is responsible for managing that and we'll have much more reliable. But next May there's a Ministry of Health meeting um, and UNICEF has been invited, WHO, some like big group to um, present about the, the, the results so far. So by then we'll ask me in six months. <laughs> Do you have an approximate <coughs> um, Well it is three per 1,000 Three to six per 1,000 for it's, it's a WHO rate. So estimating about two, 200 babies per year would be countrywide would be identified. Three to six percent. So of course there's children who are older who are hearing Any challenge? Did you face any challenges in beginning to work with the government? Um, you know, it's interesting. We've worked with the government in Ecuador, Vietnam, and Mongolia. And every government, I'm sure many of you know, um, has its own set of challenges. The Mongolian government has been, maybe it's just because they had this mandate that they wanted to act on. They've been incredibly easy to work with and really hands off, um, letting us work with the major pediatric hospital of the country. Vietnam is similar. They're a little more, in my opinion, a little more indifferent to hearing loss. That's why the partnership with the Ministry of Education was a huge breakthrough. Um, and then in a country like Ecuador, the government um, is perhaps maybe too involved. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what you're doing. Any more questions? Good. It's uh, I don't know whether there's science to this, but do you know if there's a strong correlation between hearing loss and lack of inability to speak among children, that those who are not able to hear, I mean, if one causes the other or not? Uh, but also in some of our countries, I'm looking at Uganda because we have a higher percentage of basic uh, deafness among all the people, it comes quicker in life and there's no, no intervention of any kind uh, to help them. Are there, are there some things that can treat kids, the same things that can treat adults who experience hearing loss? Yeah, that's a great question. The difference between the kids and the adults is that kids are just developing language. They don't have language yet. So what, what our goal is to help them develop spoken language so that they can go to um, mainstream schools and so forth. 
I don't you lose their hearing over time. Like you had normal hearing, then you got older or whatever, then you lose your hearing due to age or noise or <laughs> or other other factors. Um, there's that when you have you know, hearing aids and there's some um, there's different types of interventions, but it's not so language based because you already have language. You already know you already have vocabulary and language. But for the kids, um, if they don't get access to hearing technology, they won't develop spoken language because you have to hear them to be able to. So that's, that's the difference.